Welcome everyone to our tree week webinar today. Today we're going to be talking about invasive trees of Kentucky and it's tree week and tree week is a time when we celebrate all things tree, right? Uh, all the wonderful things that trees are doing for us, but there are some trees that we aren't as excited about. Uh, is that right, Franny? Yeah, definitely. There are some invasive trees that, you know, through no fault of their own, they've are here causing problems. Um, and there are species that we don't want to be seeing, uh, but we have lots of great alternatives and other species um, that are really fabulous in your landscape as well as in natural areas. And so today we're joined by Franny Preston, who's going to be talking with us about invasive trees in Kentucky. Franny is the new invasive plant outreach coordinator here at the University of Kentucky. This is a new position, and we are so excited to have Franny on board developing programs programming related to raising awareness about invasive plants and increasing education and training about them, as well as native alternatives, because we've got a lot of great ways to upgrade those invasive plants in your landscape and in your yard. Um, so before we get started, just want to take a minute to thank all of you for joining. I know that Tree Week is just a really exciting time, and there's lots of fantastic webinars and presentations and walks and talks happening. So a big shout out to Tree Week, and then want to turn things over to Franny to get us started talking about invasive trees. Thanks, Ellen. So we're going to be talking about some invasive trees, general characteristics, and then again, some native alternatives today. So I want to just kind of start out by showing why Kentucky can have so many invasive plants. Well, as we're driving down the roads, as we're going on hikes in our forests, you know, we notice a lot of different plants. Kentucky is a really great spot for a lot of plant diversity, a lot of different species, because we don't have really high, high or really low, low temperatures. We get a lot of rainfall. Unfortunately, for that same reason, invasive plants are able to establish themselves here too. It's a lot easier to establish yourself in a place with a lot of rainfall and a temperate climate rather than in the desert. So this map right here shows all of the forested plots in the state that have been invaded by invasive plants, red being the worst. And so you can see that unfortunately, most of our state has invasive plants in it, in the natural settings, and then also in our more urban settings. So I wanna go ahead and define a couple of the terms that I'll be using. So when we're talking about native trees, talking about trees that are originally from this area. So they've been in Kentucky for a really long time, They've got their niche or their role in the ecosystem. Some native trees that will come to mind easily are oak trees, maple trees, hickory trees, trees like that, that, again, have been here for a really long time and are serving their purpose. Now, non-native trees are trees that are the opposite. So they're not originally from this area. That might mean they're from across the country. That might mean they're from across the world. Now, I want to go ahead and point out during this part that just because it's a non-native tree species does not necessarily make it a bad one. Um, a lot of us in our gardens, we have some non-native species, and that does, that's okay. They can be really beautiful um, as long as they're not causing any harm. So the non-native species that are causing harm, those are what we call invasive species. Again, these species are not from this area. Um, they are non-native and they're causing a lot of problems in the environment. So some different <clears throat> features that all invasive trees that I'm going to be talking about share is that they're really hardy, but not in a good way. They're really good at being able to establish themselves both in natural and urban settings. Um, and because of that, they can really take over whatever area they're in. They can take over disturbed areas, especially which we've got a lot of. By disturbed areas, that can mean by the side of roads, that can mean by the side of a parking lot, that can mean even a place that had a fire. And these invasive spe species are really good at coming in and just taking over that area. And they're able to do this because in their native range, they would have competition from other plants and they would also have predators and pests that would keep their population under control. Now, when these plants came from across the world to Kentucky, 
they probably don't have as much competition. They don't have those native pests as well. And so they're able to just really grow in, in numbers. Some other features that really help these invasive plants become invasive and then also spread is their reproductive tendencies. So as for their sexual reproduction, they've got a lot of small seeds. Um, you can think about how easy it is for dandelions to spread because they've got a lot of tiny seeds and they come in really large quantities. So I have pictured the seeds of the Bradford pear tree, which is one of the trees we'll be talking about. And you can see this picture, they've got a lot of really tiny seeds and those tiny seeds would be in one of these little fruits on their tree. And then when an infestation of Bradford pear trees happens, just think about how many seeds are pouring out of that little area. And because they're small, they're easily transported by maybe animals such as birds. They're transported by wind or water as well. Now, another way that a lot of these invasive trees will reproduce is vegetatively. And what's happening here is they're sending up what are called root suckers. So what they're doing is their roots will go really far throughout the soil horizontally, and then they'll send up clones of themselves through the roots. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times when we try and get rid of invasive plants, it might mean cutting it down, and they'll send out their root suckers as a response to this. So we have to be careful when we're managing them, because if we just cut a tree of heaven or a mimosa tree down, in response to it, it's going to just make more of itself. If you're familiar with Greek mythology, I like to think of this kind of similar to how a hydra is in Hercules. You know, Hercules tries to cut off one of its head and then a bunch of more grow. It becomes a lot harder to manage. So they're making a lot of themselves, sure, but what are they actually doing wrong? Well, in a natural setting, invasive trees are really decreasing the biodiversity. And by that, I just mean the amount of species in the area, the amount of tree species in the area. When they do that, they create what's called a monoculture. So it's all them. They're the only ones in that area. They've just established that it's all about them. And when they're doing that, they're reducing the amount of native plants. And we know that the native plants are working as their role in the ecosystem. So when the invasive species take over, they're wiping out all of these native plants and decreasing biodiversity. The top picture is a bunch of native plants in a forest, a bunch of native trees, and we could even see a forest like this here in Kentucky. You can see there's a lot of variety. It even looks prettier. And then the bottom picture is where an invasive tree has established itself. You can see that it's the only thing there. Nothing. It's not going to let anything else grow, and that's causing some really big issues. So many big issues that invasive species are second only to habitat destruction as the leading cause of biodiversity decrease. So a lot of species are really being harmed by invasive trees, even here in Kentucky. All right, so that's invasives in a forested setting, but what about the invasives in my backyard, in your backyard? Well, they're really not great to plant in a garden because let's say you plant one of these invasive species, they're gonna wander. Their seeds and their root structures, they can really take over the area that they were planted in, and then they're going to escape. So most of the trees that we're gonna be talking about, they were planted initially to be ornamental trees, and then they escaped, established themselves outside of people's gardens, outside of people's farms, and then they wandered into a natural setting and are causing problems. Because of that, they're really hard to combat. Um, if you're familiar with pulling invasive plants or getting rid of invasive trees off of your property, you know that they're really tricky to get rid of. And they also just look pretty messy. So the bottom picture is some mimosa trees that are taking over that whole area of that person's yard. And then the top picture is some invasive mulberry trees that are doing the same thing. And they just don't really look that great. So again, what's really the big deal though is that ecosystems are completely disrupted not only are the native plants being affected by these invasive plants coming in, but the wildlife is really impacted as well. And also, invasive plants really harm us. Other than making our gardens a little bit more tricky to deal with, they also can have really big economic impacts. Um, invasive plants are really good at establishing themselves in crop fields, and so it's taking a lot of time and money to manage them there. They're really good at establishing themselves 
on public land or near roadways. And it's taking a lot of time and money for people to get rid of them there too. So just wanted to touch on a little bit more about how important native trees are for pollinators. Well, pollinators, a lot of them will prefer the plants they're adapted to. You're all probably familiar with monarchs liking milkweed and needing milkweed to survive. Um, but there's a lot of pollinator species that live on a specific tree. Okay, so the invasive trees um, outcompete these native trees and those pollinators are really affected. In fact, one study showed that native plants have been found to support 35 times more caterpillars than non-native plants. Okay, so all the caterpillars are gone. What's really the big deal with that? Well, we're losing pollinators. And then also the birds that are eating the caterpillars, they're losing out on a huge food source. And then the animals that are eating the birds, you know, they're losing out on a big food source as well. So these invasive trees are starting at the smallest level and they're affecting a whole ecosystem. Something else that's really interesting about invasive trees and insects is that not only are they harming the native insects, but they can also harbor other invasive pests. So this, these are two pests right here that you've probably heard of before that tree of heaven trees can harbor. And so if you've got some trees of heaven, then the stink bugs and the spotted lanternflies, they have more place to live, more place to thrive. And so it can be really intimidating. Um, we don't have spotted lanternflies in our state yet, but we've got a lot of tree of heaven. So we have to worry about managing those, not only because they're causing harm, but also because they're attracting, they could potentially attract this really harmful pest as well. All right, so let's talk about some invasive trees we can look out for in Kentucky. So the first one you're probably familiar with, it's called the calorie pear or that's cultivar, the Bradford pear. And these are really noticeable and easy to spot in the springtime because they've got a lot of white flowers. Of course, is why they were planted. They've got these white flowers. Um, and they've also got really round shape and their trees point, their branches point up. So I'm gonna show some maps with all of these invasive species. They're from edmaps.org. And the green counties are where these species have been reported. Now, unfortunately, they're probably in every county of the state. Um, the green areas are just where ha they have had proven reports come from. All right, so some different ways to identify the Bradford pear. Right now, this is what the leaves look like. They're kind of a darker green and they're shiny and they're crinkly. And then the bark is kind of fissured. So those are some other ways to identify the Bradford pear trees. Next one is the tree of heaven. This one is also called the stinking sumac because it looks really, really similar to our native sumac trees. Again, this is a tree that was planted for its shade purposes and also for its ornamental purposes and then escaped its intended purposes and it just really taken over. You're going to see these a lot on the sides of roads and you can see how prolific they are in our state. Some up close identifiers of the tree of heaven. These are what the leaves look like. They're opposite of each other. And when you crush them, they either smell like peanut butter or diesel, just depending on your nose. I've heard both. And then these are what the seed clusters look like. And again, they've got a bunch of seeds and they've got really small seeds. So you can notice these be really easily transported in a lot of different ways. The next one is the mimosa tree, also called the silk tree. Um, again, planted for its ornamental properties because it's got these really unique pink flowers. A lot of people like to compare them to the truffula trees from the Lorax, but I promise you the Lorax would be absolutely fine with all these trees being gone from Kentucky. They're really causing issues. Some up close characteristics of this, it's in the bean family, so it has little seed pods. And you'll notice just how tiny the little leaves are. And here's an up close picture of what the flowers look like. Another invasive tree is the princess tree. Now these get really, really big, um, but when they're younger, they look to me kind of just like a squash plant. So if you see a lot of squash looking plants growing on the side of the road and you're like, what are they doing there? It's probably a princess tree or a polonia. And you can see where they are throughout the state. 
Here is what their seed pods look like there after they fruit. And then here is what the flowers look like. They've got whitish pink flowers. Again, this is why they were planted. They were planted for their pretty flowers. Next up, we also have some invasive mulberries. So we have the paper mulberry, and you can see it's got typically more darker leaves and um, more sharper edges to the leaves. And you've also got the white mulberry, which is a little bit more of a smooth surface. But both of them are invasive and both of, both of them are causing problems. And here are some up close seeds of the paper mulberry and then what a little white mulberry tree might look like. A lot of times you'll find them if you have a tree line next to your yard or maybe where you work, you might find these invasive mulberries kind of growing low near the bottom of the other trees. So that's, we've talked about why they're causing problems and then some of the invasive species in our state. So what's being done? Who's doing anything about it? Don't worry, people are doing what they can. And um, one of the main things that is important for battling these invasive species is raising awareness. So thank you guys for coming and learning today. You're becoming more aware of these invasive species in government agencies, universities and extension like us here at UK and also nonprofits are um, really pushing to teach people more about these invasive species. That way more people are involved in not planting them but also potentially helping to manage them as well. So how are invasive species managed? Well, the absolute best way to have not have an invasive species in an area is to not plant an invasive species, which sounds pretty easy. But unfortunately, a lot of these invasive species are still sold at both large retailers and sometimes even small nurseries. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more later about where to find um, some good native alternatives, but Again, we just want to make sure that we're not planting invasive species. Um, and okay, instead, what do we plant so that the invasive species can't take over that area? Well, it, again, it can be a non-native species, um, just one that we make sure is not invasive. Native species are best. What do we do if the invasive species is already established in the yard or already established in the field, in the forest? Well, depending on the species, it's going to require some different management. Um, some invasive species, even some of these trees, when they're young enough, can just be pulled up. Just make sure you get the whole root. Some of them are cut down. Some of them are pruned. Um, some of them that require more extensive management, they'll be mowed over multiple times a year. Maybe disking is used. Sometimes prescribed fire is used as well. There is a caveat to this, though, because if you'll remember, invasive species can really thrive in disturbed areas. So sometimes fire will actually create a disturbed area that the invasive species can come back with even more. So a lot of the times a combined approach is needed. So that includes maybe manual management and herbicide spraying as well. So what can we all do to help? Um, well, again, just knowing what's out there is so important. So the Kentucky Exotic Pest Plant Council on their website, you can find a whole big list of invasive plants in Kentucky. Some of them are known invasive, some of them might become invasive. So maybe you're looking to update your garden and you want to make sure that you're not planting an invasive plant. This is a really great resource to use because you can just go on there and think, oh, I shouldn't plant that in my yard now. If you want to learn what plants are in your yard already to see if you have some any, any invasive species, there's a few different ways you can do that. Um, one of my favorite tools to use when even I'm learning new plants is using iNaturalist or Seek by iNaturalist. If you have a smartphone, you can get these as apps, but you can also just take pictures with a regular camera and then upload these to the iNaturalist website. Um, and you can have these websites identify the plants in your yard for you. So you can point at it and it'll tell you, oh, that's tree of heaven. So you know you want to try and combat that in your yard. And then the couple sites on the top, again, EdMaps are the ones that I used on the invasive species slides, the Wild Spotter. And both of these, they are used for um, tracking invasive species. So you can go to their website, learn a little bit more about these species, and then also see their distribution. Um, and it also really helps if you have a known invasive species in your yard. 
If you can post it to one of these sites, you can even do it to iNaturalist. It really helps people who are researching these invasive species, and it really helps people who are managing them as well. That way they can know how prolific they are and um, where to best focus their management. So we talked a little bit about planting native plants. Um, if you're looking, if you're a little bit confused about where to find native plants to plant in your yard, um, there's some great resources out there. So there is a nursery list on Kentucky Native Plant Society's website. Um, that'll show if there's one in your area, but some of them might be online as well. And you can find great list of plants to plant in your yard. And you can also just contact your typical nursery or supplier that you use about some native plants that they offer if you're looking to add some native plants to your yard. I mean, I will say gardening with native plants a lot of the times can make your gardening experience even easier because if it's a plant that is specially adapted to live in that area with that soil and that climate, a lot of times it's going to be a little bit easier to maintain. So what are some native alternatives for these invasive trees? Thankfully, we have some. So if you're not familiar with the USDA plant hardiness zone, I um, just want to bring it up. These show, this is a map of where different plants can be grown, and it just shows the lowest temperature that it gets in that area in the winter. So Kentucky falls between six and a seven in the hardiness zones, but um, some different regions of Kentucky might vary a little bit. Um, I'm mentioning this because I'm going to talk about where these different plants can be planted within their zones. All right, so our invasive Bradford pear. What are some good alternatives for this? Again, people planted this because the white flowers, I'll be honest, they're really pretty. But again, the Bradford pears are causing so much harm. So if we're attracted to this tree because of the white flowers, let's instead find another tree that's native with white flowers. One option for that is the dogwood tree. Um, it is visited by pollinators. So if you're looking to help the pollinators and the birds out, and this is a really great tree. It's got these beautiful white blooms. Um, it's a bit of a um, smaller to medium sized tree and it can be 30 to 40 feet tall. They typically prefer partial shade. So they're really great to grow next to buildings or maybe as a, an understory tree if you've got some taller trees in your yard. And they can be planted in zones five to nine. Another option for a white flowered tree is the service berry. This one's pretty fun. Um, it blooms in early spring, earlier than a lot of the other trees do, um, even before it gets leaves, I believe. And the birds will also eat the berries, also a great pollinator tree. Another bonus for the service berry is it's got this beautiful fall color pictured on the bottom right picture. They grow about 30 feet tall, so again, about an, a smaller tree. And they prefer full sun or partial shade. They grow in zones four through nine. All right, so our next invasive tree, the tree of heaven. I mentioned this earlier, it looks very similar to our native sumac species. So a really great option for um, replacing the tree of heaven, if you're looking for a native alternative, is native sumac species. So you've got a few to choose from. We've got staghorn, winged, or smooth sumac. They all look slightly different in their leaves. Um, they also have a really fun fall color. And these are really great for songbirds and other wildlife as well. They grow in zones four through eight. All right, what about our mimosa tree? So again, planted as an ornamental because of the color of its flowers. So I'm going to list a couple of options if you want a reddish or a pink or a white flower. Um, one option is a red buckeye. So this one can also attract pollinators. And it prefers shade or full sun, but it'll kind of grow depending on where it's planted. It can be smaller and almost shrubby if it's planted in the shade. If it's grown in full sun and managed for that way, it can get a little bit taller. And it grows in zones four through eight. And buckeyes are really fun because they've got really big leaves and they're, they've got a really unique look. Another option alternative for the mimosa tree is the fringe tree. And this has flowers that look a little bit more similar to the mimosa tree. They're just white instead. And fringe trees are actually in the olive family. So their fruits look like tiny little olives. And the songbirds will actually enjoy these fruit, pollinated by bees. Now these prefer sun and moist soil um, and grow in zones four through nine. All right, so the princess tree, 
A native alternative for the princess tree is the eastern redbud. This is one of my absolute favorite trees. Um, the seeds are consumed by songbirds and other wildlife. I've also heard that you can eat the um, flower blooms, but I haven't tried that yet. And they prefer full sun or light shade. They typically grow a smaller trees. They're really great to have in your yard and they prefer moist soils too. And these are really fun trees, <clears throat> not just because of their flowers, but also because they've got heart-shaped leaves. Another alternative to the princess tree is the catalpa tree. Now, catalpa trees and princess trees actually look very, very close, even with their flowers. So catalpa trees are really great because the wildlife eat the seeds. They are a host plant for the catalpa sphinx moth. If you remember um, how I talked about some pollinators need a specific tree. They prefer full sun to part shade and a variety of soils are fine, growing stones four through nine. And these trees are gonna get pretty tall as well. Um, if you look at the bottom left picture, that's what their flowers look like. Their flowers bloom in the summer, um, sometimes after a lot else has bloomed. And so they're really pretty. They've also got heart-shaped leaves, but they are a lot bigger. All right, for our invasive mulberries, an easy alternative native tree is the red mulberry. It's got some beneficial fruits that are also really yummy. Um, they are a host plant to morning cloak butterflies. They prefer full sun and the moist soil and can be grown in zones three through eight. So they're a little bit more cold hardy. Um, they also have got a really great fall color. And you can see just how similar the invasive mulberry leaves look with the native mulberry, but you'll notice that the little teeth at the edge of the leaf are a little bit more round rather than pointy. If you're looking for another fruit tree, um, the pawpaw trees are all a craze right now. They've got edible fruit. They're a little bit smaller trees. They're 15 to 20 feet tall. They can grow in the sun or the shade. A lot of the times where you're gonna find pawpaw trees in the forest if you're going on a hike is um, within a closed canopy as a, more of an understory tree. They grow in zones five through eight. So if you haven't eaten a pawpaw before, they're really great fall food. Um, they're, I believe, the biggest berry in the United States that naturally grows here. They've got really fun flowers too. And then pawpaw leaves are really big and tropical looking. So they are a native species, but they have some characteristics of more tropical desirable species as well. Another fruit tree option that's native is the persimmon tree. This also has edible fruit for us, which makes it a really fun, um, but also good for wildlife. These will grow a little bit taller. They're 35 to 60 foot trees. They prefer full sun being a taller tree and they'll grow in zones four through nine. One great thing about persimmon trees is their shape. So they've got, um, you know, your typical beautiful tree shape, um, really straight trunk and then um, more circular branches. All right, so I listed a bunch of native tree options, but I just wanted to point out that you we should all just do what we can. So you might not have a yard that su can support something the size of a tree, but you might have a yard that can support maybe some native flowers instead. So every plant that we plant really counts and it really matters. So I just want to say just do what you can. If you have a large property and can manage the invasive trees on it, and then plant some native trees, that's great. If you have a smaller property, you can um, maybe plant one of the smaller trees to add a great native addition to your yard or look into some herbaceous plants as well. I appreciate you all learning about invasive trees today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat now or my email is down below. Feel free to email me anytime with questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Franny. That was a wonderful presentation. Lots to think about, about um, kind of looking out for invasives, as well as ways to upgrade these species in your landscape, in your yard. Um, you know, there's there's better plants out there for a variety of reasons. And so thanks for raising some of them. I, of course, have some favorites of mine in that list. Maybe you do, too, if you're watching. And so feel free to put those in the chat. Or maybe there are other things that you're like, maybe this would be perfect for someone uh, that you should definitely let us know about. Um, before we go to any questions, um, and if you've got them, please put them in the chat. Uh, 
we want to hear from you. We want to know uh, what you thought of the webinar series overall. So please help us by completing the survey. You can look at this QR code on your phone. It'll take you to a Qualtrics survey. It's really short. And just let us know what you think, because we hope to continue doing this webinar series each year. And so we want to know what topics should we do next year? Uh, you know, what are you concerned about? So help us out with that. Um, and I'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, in addition, I just want to, again, remind you to check out our upcoming, we have one more Tree Week webinar that's coming up today at noon, um, Campus Woods, talking about wood utilization. But if you liked this, if you heard Franny's talk and were like, I want to hear more, I like this, um, check out our whole Forestry and Natural Resources Extension team uh, YouTube page. We do a weekly webcast program called From the Woods Today with um, information about invasive plants uh, and a lot of other things. So each week, different speakers and different topics. So again, um, let us know what questions you have there. Um, so with that, let's let's head over to the chat and see what kind of questions came up. Um, one of them that I saw was a question about burning bush. So today's talk was mostly on invasive trees. And the line between a tree and a shrub sometimes can be pretty fine, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I've seen some some burning bush and some bush honeysuckle, um, which while I typically consider them shrubs, that are tree-sized, some big ones, <laughs> especially bush honeysuckle. I feel like a big bush honeysuckle is a small tree sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but also invasives. And we could do this whole, maybe we should do a whole other one, Franny, on invasive shrubs. Invasive in shrubs, yeah. Landscape. There's plenty of them, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And invasive, uh, a burning bush is an interesting one because um, the species that we call burning bush, uh, Euonymus elatus, is considered invasive. It's that straight species, and you can find it in the woods around Kentucky doing the same kinds of things that bush honeysuckle does. Um, I've seen it in the Louisville area, really dense thicket of nothing but burning bush. Now, it looks pretty but you don't want to have that invasive in there decreasing the, the diversity for all the reasons that Franny said. So even if it looks nice in your yard, it might cause problems elsewhere. But I will also say that there are lots of other species that we call burning bush. There are native relatives, things like wahoo, strawberry bush, hearts are bursting, um, that sometimes people call burning bush. And they are close relatives, although they look a little different and don't quite have that same uh, level of really dense leaves that are brilliant red, but I still think they're beautiful. And um, another one is that some, there are cultivars available of burning bush that are thought to be less invasive, that are sterile or mostly sterile. So, you know, that's another thing to think about is that for some of these species, um, you know, they might cause problems when they get out in nature, but perhaps there are better alternatives available. So wanted to throw that out there. Let's see if there are other questions in the chat. Um, I see someone commenting about the fruits of service berry or edible for humans. They mm. are, and they are delicious. I got to try some this year for the first time and I've been missing out. I never knew how good they were. Um, so if you can catch them before the birds eat them, you're in luck because they are delicious. <laughs> uh, let's see. The um, I see someone asking when the slides will be available, and we can do one better than that. We can make the whole presentation available. So um, the recording of this is going to be available on YouTube, and I'll post the link to that in just a minute um, so you can see where all those will be. They'll be at the KY Forest Health um, YouTube page. And not only can you find all of these, if you're interested in learning more about invasive plants, we have... Um, the entire invasive plant conference from last year. Each year we host a Kentucky invasive plant conference and we have all of the past few conferences that are available and you can check them out, um, all the recordings there for free. Uh, so um, check out the YouTube page, KY Forest Health. And speaking of which, uh, if you want to learn more about invasive plants and what's going on with them, uh, we have the Kentucky Invasive Plant Conference is coming up November 2nd in Frankfort, Kentucky. And I'll put this on the screen so you can uh, 
see that information right here. Um, you are welcome to register for that. You can see this QR code right here and take a picture of that. Um, and I'll put the link in the chat. Um, but it's going to be a full day of learning all about invasive plants and their management. Franny will be there. I will be there. Um, and lots of experts from all over the state who can talk with you about invasive plants. So do we have any other questions? Randy, anything else that you wanted to add? Don't think so. I think someone commented that they love catalpas but never seen them in a nursery for sale. And you're right. Some of these native trees, um, they might not be widely available in typical nurseries, but a lot of them can be ordered online. And that um, nursery list on the Kentucky Native Plant Society's website can probably provide you a resource, um, maybe of like an online way to order those seedlings or saplings. Um, and I see that we got a question about composting invasive species. Can you compost them or is that a bad idea? Mm, that's a great question. Um, yeah, composting can be great because, you know, we're returning nutrients to the soil. In my experience, I've used compost from my garden before that I didn't know had some other seeds on it and it completely took over my garden. Um, so no. yeah, so you've got to be careful about what's in the compost because it can, yeah, the seeds might stick in there from the invasive species and they might take over if you're using your compost for gardening as well. And I think one challenge is that like, if you were, had like a commercial composting operation where things got really hot, um, maybe it would be totally fine and the seeds would break down. But I don't know about your compost, Franny, mine's probably not at that level. No, no, um, no. So, it, you know, I'm not going to be as effectively killing those seeds. But that to say, like it depends and it depends, is it in seed what you're trying to compost or not? Um, one question that I do get from folks who are doing like bush honeysuckle management is if you're managing bush honeysuckle and you've got all these plants, um, what do you do about the the plants that you've just cut down? Um, do you need to take them out or move them somewhere? And that's one where you can just leave them right where they are. And it's not really composting, but they will break down rapidly on their own. In just a few years, you won't even notice it. And in the meantime, if you want, you can even kind of pile them together to make um, some habitat for wildlife, have other benefits as it's decomposing naturally. Um, but that's a little different. Um, so it just depends. Is this something that's in seed or not? Um, and if it is in seed, then that's something I'd be wary of. Similarly, if it's something that can uh, root adventitiously, like you took a little sprig of it and then you lay it down and it can start rooting into things, you want to be a little cautious of that. Uh, for example, winter creeper. If I'm pulling winter creeper up and out of the ground, I might maybe hang it hang it up in a, a, a like the crook of a tree or take all that out and chip it or um, pile it up and, and compost it on something dry because if you just put it back down on the ground it might just root and continue growing are there any other questions um, I've put in the chat the link to the YouTube channel where these will all be posted, as well as a link to the survey. Um, so let us know what you think. Um, I see someone commenting that my invasives go into the fire pit, which is another another great use for them. Um, I hear that calorie pear makes a really uh, good wood um, for uh, barbecue. Uh, is that right? Does anybody have any comments on this? <laughs> well. Uh, you know, might as well use your invasives to the best of your ability if you've got them. So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining today. Uh, great to have you. And thank you so much, Franny. Uh, we are really excited to have you here at the University of Kentucky, um, the increasing everything about invasive plant awareness and uh, management and getting better landscape plants um, out there. So welcome and uh, thank you again. Um, for everyone else, we're going to sign off today or for now, but feel free to join us at noon for our Campus Woods Wood Utilization Talk.